So I'm clicking go live now. Uh, let's see. Uh, and I'm not sure how we're looking though with this. We are still in delay. <laughs> okay. So uh, thanks everyone who is joining us today. Today we have Ian uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where Ian is a PhD student advised by Aditya Ramdas. Um, uh, Ian is broadly interested in statistics and machine learning with a focus on anytime valid sequential inference, non-parametric methods, and causal inference. And today specifically, we're pleased to have Ian speak about doubly robust uh, confidence sequences for sequential causal inference. So passing the microphone to you, Ian. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jeb. Thanks for the, the introduction and for the invitation. It's uh, really exciting to be here. Um, so yeah, like, like Jeb was saying, I'll be talking about some recent work on uh, confidence sequences, sequential inference, and how they tie into uh, causal inference more generally. So um, I think, so Jeb already gave a bit of an introduction, so I don't need to spend too much time on this slide, but uh, I was just going to say my research focus is, is on uh, sequential inference, non-parametric methods, and causal inference, as well as some things in uh, election auditing. But today I'll just be talking about the first three. It'll be sort of like a, a mix and mash of, of all three of those. Um, okay, so I'll just jump right in. So uh, I guess uh, we'll just add, Ian, that if people yeah. feel like they have any questions, feel free to post them in YouTube comments uh, or YouTube, YouTube chat, and then we will pause and answer your questions. Yeah. Thank okay, you. sounds good. Okay, so uh, this work that I'll be talking about today is, is a joint work with uh, my four awesome collaborators here. So uh, David Arbor and Richard Sinha, these were my supervisors when I was an intern at Adobe Research last summer. And uh, Edward and Aditya, these are my advisors at CMU. Um, okay, so the, the broad goal of this talk is sequential uncertainty quantification for causal effects. Um, so I just wanted to give just maybe a broad uh, overview of some things that you want to achieve in this work. And then I'll sort of expand on all of those and then hopefully convince you by the end that, that we've actually achieved them. So we want to derive uh, rigorous statistical methods and uh, practical algorithms with the following properties. We want to be able to perform statistical inference for causal effects in an online setting as new data become available. So we don't want to be restricted by a, uh, a fixed sample size. We don't want to be assuming that we observe all the data at one time. Instead, we have our sample size growing as the study progresses. Um, we want these methods to work in both randomized experiments and in observational studies. So randomized experiments are obviously great if we have, if we have access to them, if we can actually perform a randomized experiment. But of course, sometimes observational components may pop up in even in randomized experiments, and, uh, and also sometimes it might not be feasible or ethical to perform a randomized experiment. So sometimes we'll just, uh, we'll be forced to deal with observational data. And so we want these methods to work in both settings um, and sort of adapt to both. Uh, we wanna make minimal non-parametric assumptions on, on our data. So we don't want to assume any sort of linearity or Gaussian, uh, Gaussian errors or anything like that. Um, and finally, we want to, where possible, we want to leverage state-of-the-art machine learning tools to improve estimation. So where we can, we want to use machine learning to both uh, get maybe better estimators of causal effects, but also to get tighter confidence sets, um, and in particular, tighter confidence sequences. Uh, so if you, if you were at the, uh, Aditya gave a talk, I think about three weeks ago, uh, on the doubly sequential regime. Just if you were at that talk, I wanted to put in context what this, what this form of uh, sequential is. So when Aditya was uh, giving his talk, he talked about uh, sort of a sequence of sequential experiments. So, so a, an experiment that might start and stop uh, over time, and then another experiment might, might start and stop. And, and these would these, the starting and stopping may happen asynchronously. So you might get something that looks 
sort of like this. So this is a cartoon that Aditya gave me to use. So if you have an experiment here, an experiment here. So each each of these uh, lines represent one represents one sequential experiment unfolding over time, and then this this whole plot can be thought of as a sequence of these sequential experiments. And so uh, when I say sequential in this talk, I'm talking about one of these inner processes, one of these inner sequential experiments. Um, but in particular, we'll be focused on uh, treatment effect estimation in, in these sequential uh, experiments or sequential observational studies. So uh, for a motivating for motivating the example, let's talk about uh, sequential experiments. So uh, we'll imagine that, so, so they all sort of take this, this general form. So for each time step T, and, and when I say time step, I mean every time maybe a new data point is observed, there doesn't need to be any sort of like hourly, monthly, daily, uh, temporal association with time. You can observe like 10 people on the first day, 100 people on the second day, zero people on the third day, and so on. We're just thinking for each time step T, we observe a new data point. Um, so we'll recruit a subject uh, with covariates XT. So these could be things like demographics, age, sex. Um, if you're in a if you're in a sequential clinical setting, maybe their medical history or drugs that they're taking. Um, if you're in an A/B testing environment, maybe the device version or the browser that they're using, something like that. Um, and so we'll also assign that subject to treatment group. Uh, we'll denote that by one. And, the, and then the, the control group by zero. So we're thinking about binary treatments in this talk. Um, and so they'll be assigned to the treatment group with some probability pi of, X, pi of XT. So if you're in a Bernoulli experiment, this could just be, this pi would just be one half or, or like you know 10% or something, or you're just basically assigning people to treatment groups with, with coin flips. Uh, but these can also depend on covariates XT. That's also fine. Um, and then we'll observe some outcome of interest. So if you're in a clinical setting, maybe the effectiveness of some drug, or if you're in an A-B testing setting, maybe uh, user engagement or ad clicks or something like that. And so the, the general goal will be to estimate the average treatment effect. So this is, this is a counterfactual quantity, which is essentially the, this Y superscript one and Y superscript uh, zero in the expectation. This is, this whole quantity is, representing the, the average population outcome that would occur if we treated everyone to the, if we, if we assigned everyone to the treatment group versus if we assigned everyone to the control group. And so this is a, it's a counterfactual quantity in the sense that we don't actually get to observe everyone's trajectory if they were put into both treatment and control. We only get to observe one or the other and sometimes not even that. So, um, so this is a, this is a so-called counterfactual quantity that we can't hope to estimate immediately, but on the next slide, we'll just talk about some assumptions that one typically has to make to, to actually get at this from, from data. But for now, just think about this is the, this is our target estimator, or sorry, target estimand. And the, the question is, how do we estimate this quantity in a sequential experiment? And going a little bit further, how do we estimate this and provide uncertainty quantification in a sequential fashion. So, that, so we're not just getting, uh, we're not just estimating this from a sequential experiment and having a confidence interval at one time step, but we want to have a sequence of, of confidence intervals that we can that we can use adaptively sort of over time. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. Um, so before I jump into the, the sequential estimation of this of this parameter, I just have to talk about the, the non-sequential case. Um, so this is, so I'll, I'll, I'll be glossing over some, some details, but basically this is due to a long line of pioneering work by Jamie Robbins, and Andrzej Rutnicki, Mark Vanderland, and a lot of their colleagues, and, and many others. Um, but basically the setting that they're, that they're looking at is this, the setting where you have triplets, X, A, and Y, they're coming from some distribution P, and again, X, are our covariates, so things that we measure about a, an individual, A being the treatment, um, zero or one in our case, or the outcome, uh, sorry, and Y is the, the outcome. And so remember, this is our target parameter, psi, or the average treatment effect, I might say ATE. Um, and so, like I said, this was a, this is a counterfactual quantity, but under some assumptions, 
namely these three, uh, we can actually start to hope to estimate it. So basically we'll need the these three causal identification assumptions. The first one being consistency, which essentially just says that if someone is treatment, sorry, if someone is treated at level little a, little a being zero or one, then the outcome that we observe is actually their counterfactual outcome. So this, this almost seems like it has to be true in some cases, like if I treat someone with, with uh, you know, if I assign someone to the treatment group, then I'll see what happened to them if they were assigned to the treatment group. But this can sometimes fail if you're in uh, a setting with uh, interference, um, like in a, maybe in a vaccine trial, for example, immunity can, someone can be immune just because their friends are immune, uh, even if they're not given the vaccine, things like that. Um, and so, so that's, but, but we'll need to actually assume this. So for the remainder of the talk, let's just assume that this, this holds. In a, in a lot of settings, it will, uh, but you just have to reason about it in the context of the problem that you're interested in. Um, the second assumption is the no unmeasured confounding assumption. And this basically just says that uh, treatments are as good as randomized within levels of the covariate X. Um, so so in, a, in a randomized experiment, uh, this will hold by design, so we'll, we'll actually set the we'll set the uh, the treatment to be a, a, like a randomized coin flip or something like that. But in an observational study, we'd have to sort of reason about uh, whether this this holds or not. In an observational study, typically what we'll need to do is collect a rich enough set of covariates x such that we can explain that confounding. Uh, and then the positivity assumption just basically says that. Uh, everyone has some positive probability of being assigned to uh, both treatment and control groups. So in a, again, in, a, in the context of a randomized experiment, this will always hold uh, by design. We'll always be able to assign people to uh, either treatment or control group with some positive probability. But in, uh, in an observational study, we have to actually think about whether this holds. So basically under these three causal identification assumptions, this is a, these are very, well-known results that this can actually be, this target parameter here can be identified as this statistical quantity. So now this is just a difference of expectations. And uh, this we can now hope to estimate from data so, because this is just a functional of the distribution P. And so the goal will be to estimate this quantity with minimal assumptions on P, but also uh, with hopefully as high precision as possible. Um, and I guess even if these, I should also say just as a, as a minor remark, if these assumptions don't hold and these, these are not identified, this still might be an interesting statistical quantity. It might just not have a causal interpretation. But under these assumptions, it does also have a causal interpretation, namely as the average treatment effect. Okay. Uh, so for the sake of, um, of estimating this quantity with high precision, We'll want to use this, this very nice doubly robust estimator. So this is also sometimes known as the augmented inverse probability weighted estimator. Um, it's basically just this uh, sample average of these functions f, which are functions of the data. So I don't want to get too much into the, how this, where this comes about, but basically it's a function that, that is, it's a function of the data, and it depends on these uh, so-called nuisance functions. So these are uh, this is a regression function, the expected outcome of, of y given covariates x among those treated at level little a, little a being zero or one. And it also depends on the propensity score, which isn't always a nuisance. Like if we're in a randomized experiment, we know this. In an observational study, it's, it's, it's a nuisance. We might not know what this is. Um, so, these, so these actually need to be estimated based on the data. And so we'll, we'll do that um, a little bit later. But for now, let's just pretend that that we have these functions exactly, just for the sake of, of uh, motivation. So if, if we actually know this function f exactly, then we can take this sample average, and now we've got an estimator. And this, this estimator is well known that, that it is asymptotically normal and is centered at the true ATE. And so we can then compute uh, confidence intervals for the ATE in large samples. Um, Ian, and yeah, if I may add, maybe just to some context uh, for people in the talk, like the, what kind of uh, data would be used for this particular 
estimator is like if someone imagines a table of the day of data where we have features of some I don't know patients and then we have their outcomes and uh, given the treatment so we would then est estimate uh, like, I don't know someone could use random forest I suppose for estimating the parameter uh, nuisance parameter mu <clears throat> or to to predict what would be the outcome given the patient's features uh, for that particular treatment correct yeah yeah exactly so um, I haven't I haven't yet gotten into how to estimate these things but there will be a, a discussion on that later and exactly sort of what you said we want to use some some flexible non-parametric machine learning models like like random forest but we'll also combine it with some other things and that'll that'll help us out in both randomized and observational settings Excellent, yeah that's, that's a great that's a great point um, okay, and so just as a as a minor note for, for those interested, this this is this doubly robust estimator isn't just one good estimator. It's it's a very good estimator in the sense that it's it's asymptotically optimal um, in a in sort of a semi-parametric uh, sense. It it attains sort of a, a semi semi-parametric analog of the Kramer Rao lower bound. But um, yeah, that's sort of an aside. If just think about this as a as a good estimator. Um, so what about the case where n is not fixed in advance, right? So if it, when we're in our sequential experiment, we don't have this, this uh, you know, set of n triplets. Instead, we have the, the triplet 1, triplet 2, up till triplet t, and then we observe triplet t plus 1 and t plus 2, and we don't have any, you know, predefined sort of uh, horizon that we're, that we're going to stop at. So, so we just have these, these triplets sort of coming in over time. We might be tempted to just compute confidence intervals at each of these times, um, but this actually doesn't. This wouldn't allow us to provide valid statistical inference when we stop sampling, because now our our uh, sample size n is a data dependent quantity, right? If I if I look at confidence intervals from time one up till time t, and I say, okay, I don't, I don't really like I don't really like how the confidence interval looks, it just includes this null value that I'm interested in. I'm just going to keep on sampling. Um, if, I, if I do that uh, in a, using traditional fixed time confidence intervals, then when you stop, that n is now, it, it's a data dependent quantity and there's no sort of coverage guarantees. We can't call it a one minus alpha confidence interval because it doesn't have those, those uh, guarantees anymore. So what we'll want are these things called confidence sequences, and we'll want to develop them for the ATE in a way that uh, actually allows us to provide valid inference at, at all stopping times, uh, data dependent or not. So this will allow us to, to do exactly what I just said before, where we, we track our intervals over time and maybe say, ah, I don't, I, I might want to just keep on sampling a little bit more to see to see where this thing goes. That's that's absolutely fine if you use a competence sequence. It's 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 encouraged. Um, so just as a as a brief primer on confidence sequences, these were, uh, you know, pioneered in the in the late '60s and and '70s by Robbins, uh, different than Jamie Robbins. This is Herbert Robbins, Darling, Siegmund, and a lot of their colleagues. So a uh, a confidence sequence for some parameter that you're interested in theta is a sequence of these confidence sets such that it has this time uniform guarantee. And what this is saying is that the parameter theta is, contain is contained in every single one of these, uh, every single one of these intervals simultaneously for all times t with high probability. Uh, and another way of thinking about this is theta is contained in the intersection of C1, C2, up to CT, and CT plus one. So no matter where you stop, theta will be in that interval in particular with high probability. Uh, so this should be contrasted with the classical uh, confidence intervals, which say, if I fix the time, uh, if I fix a, a sample size N, then I'll cover this parameter theta with high probability. But this doesn't necessarily say that theta will be contained in every single one of C1 to C2 of the Cn, Cn plus one with high probability. In fact, we can, as I'll just explain on the next slide, uh, or maybe on this slide, uh, it will eventually miscover if you use classical confidence intervals typically. 
So this is what uh, these confidence sequences and confidence intervals look like. So in green, the green dotted line are, are these uh, fixed time confidence intervals. So, if, but it's a sequence of them. So if we were to just track this over time, you'll notice that this covers at this point, it, or sorry, that it miscovers at this point, miscovers here, miscovers here, but at the same time, it is, it is covering at many of these points. Um, but basically, if you look at the, uh, the solid orange line, this is simultaneously capturing this, this uh, treatment effect of 0.4 uh, uniformly over time from the start of the study until the end, and, e and even asymptotically. You could keep on running this, and this, these orange lines would, would contain this value with high probability. And so this is, um, you know, it's not like every single time you will see multiple miscovers by the, the confidence interval, but typically you will. And in particular, if you, if you run this long enough, the, the confidence interval will essentially at some point uh, make an error. And so this is somewhat uh, explained in this uh, plot on the right-hand side. So what this is saying here is that, so that on the vertical axis, we have the cumulative miscoverage rate. So if we take a time step uh, 10 to the four, 10,000, uh, then what this is saying is, for the confidence sequence, what is the probability, in this case, an empirical probability, this is from, I think, 10,000 uh, resamples, 10,000 simulations, but what is the probability that at any time before this, and including this time, 10,000, did I miscover? What is, the, what is the chance that I'd miscover from any time before this until now? And so this is, a, this is an increasing, uh, this value is, is uh, always non-decreasing, non and in particular, this line will never cross the 10% threshold. So this is our alpha level here. This is our desired error level. So this line will never cross 10%, uh, even, even off at infinity. On the other hand, the confidence interval, it starts at about 10%. So it, it, it will miscover about 10% of the time. That's, that's to be expected. That's how confidence intervals are sort of designed. But the point is, if you use it in a sequential fashion, then your, your chance of making an error at any time goes up steadily. And at time, you know, 100,000, this is looking like something like 75%. And uh, one can show that this will actually go off to one. So with probability one, someone will eventually uh, miscover, make an error. Okay. Uh, so but the takeaway from these uh, confidence sequences for practical purposes is that they can be updated when new data become available. Uh, it, you can run an experiment and continuously monitor it and stop the experiment or continue it for, for any data dependent reason. And uh, no matter when you stop, uh, whether it's a random or a data dependent stopping time, the type one error is controlled, which is something that we don't enjoy with uh, confidence intervals. Okay, so uh, just bringing this back to the average treatment effect. So now, now we've, we've sort of Got the machinery set up for, or, or at least the definitions for confidence sequences. Now we'd like to actually construct one of these for the average treatment effect in sequential settings. So remember, in, in the fixed time setting, we had that you know this estimator was asymptotically normal and centered at the true ATE here. And so, in particular, I said we could construct these uh, asymptotic or large sample confidence intervals for for that parameter of interest. And so. What this means is that we take our, our estimator plus or minus an estimated standard deviation, a quantile of a normal divided by root n. This is typically the, the part of the confidence interval that we consider the, the approximate confidence interval. And then there's some other vanishing little op term. This is basically just saying that there's some negligible error here that is vanishing faster than this term in probability. And so basically, the, this basically says that we can use this part as, as an approximate confidence interval for this parameter. Um, so before we start thinking about uh, constructing confidence sequences for the, the average treatment effect, we need to ask, how do we construct an asymptotic confidence sequence? Because typically confidence sequences are defined sort of non-asymptotically. They're supposed to hold for all, all times uniformly. So what is the notion, what is the right notion of an asymptotic uh, confidence sequence? So on the next slide, I'll just give you a, a theorem that, that we need for this. And then 
right after this, I'll just basically immediately apply it to the situation of the, the ATE. So imagine you have a, a sequence of random variables, y1, y2, and so on, coming from a distribution p with some common mean mu and more than two moments. Okay, so pretty weak, weak conditions. Um, let mu hat t and, and uh, sigma squared hat t be the sam sample mean and sample variance based on the first t observations. So at time t, we'll be able to compute mu hat t, sigma squared hat t. At time t plus one, we can compute new estimate, estimates of these things and so on. Um, then this expression here, this forms a one minus alpha competence sequence for the mean mu. Um, and so while it might not look like it, this, this term right here is shrinking at a rate of square root log t by t. And this term here is shrinking at a faster square root log log t by t rate. And it's even faster than that. And it's almost surely. The almost surely is a bit of a subtle point because we need this, this, uh, this approximation to be valid uniformly over time. But, but the gist is this, uh, width right here of the competence sequence will become uh, arbitrarily close to the, the true competence sequence. So in this sense, it is a, an asymptotic competence sequence. Um, and so this, this very closely matches what we had on the previous slide with the uh, sort of asymptotic confidence interval. Okay, but so now we have this notion of an asymptotic confidence sequence. And so we can immediately apply this to the average treatment effect. So everything in blue here is just uh, what's been replaced on the previous slide with things that are relevant for the average treatment effect. So this is theorem one prime. So now we're imagining that instead of y1 up to yt, we have uh, we have these functions of our data, functions of x, a, and y coming from a distribution p with mean psi. And let these two things be as before, the sample mean and sample variance based on the first the first uh, t influence functions would be the first t of these f's. Um, and then this expression here, this is the exact same expression as, as uh, before, except now we replace the sample mean with this, the uh, sample variance with this, and, uh, and this exactly forms a one minus alpha competence sequence for the average treatment effect. Okay. And so, Oh yeah, one minor point is that this, this term here depends on this row squared value. This is just, this can be thought of as a tuning parameter, which di dictates at which time the, the confidence sequence is tightest, right? So even though no matter what value of row squared you pick here, this interval will still shrink at a rate of square root log t by t. So it'll still shrink to a single point being the, the truth, but nevertheless, you can pick this so that, you, so that it dictates which time uh, that confidence sequence will be tightest. So this plot is just basically showing the ratio of a confidence interval to a confidence sequence. So it's like basically larger values on the vertical axis correspond to uh, tighter confidence sequences. So if you were to optimize, if you were to pick row squared to be optimized for time t being 100, then of course you, you start out nicely here and then it slowly drops off. Um, on the other hand, if you were to optimize for time 5,000, it's tightest right around here at 5,000. And it's still pretty tight even off till 10,000, but near the beginning, it's, it's not quite as tight. So these are just different shapes of boundaries that one would construct, construct from different values of row squared. Um, but nevertheless, no matter what value of row squared you pick, um, these confidence sequences will sh shrink to a, a single point. Okay, so um, now let's let's talk about this this issue of actually estimating nuisance functions. So remember the we had this W robust uh, estimator. It was the sample average of these functions that depended on on uh, this mu one, mu zero, and pi, and these were potentially unknown. And one way of just looking at this is that this mu a of of x. This is just a regression function. This is just expected outcome given covariates among those treated at level little a, a being zero or one. And pi of x, if we don't know it, it's just, it's just uh, you know, 
well, in, in both cases, it's just this uh, probability of being treated. But uh, if, if it's unknown, then we can just look at this as sort of a classification problem, right? And so this is sort of the, the first thing that we learn in machine learning class is how to tackle regression and classification. And so machine learning has a lot of really nice algorithms that are very well suited to these tasks. Um, of course, there are some issues that can arise if we estimate these uh, nuisance functions from the same data as those used to build our estimator, right? Because um, if we were to if we were to use, say, uh, the teeth data point uh, to to construct the regression function, and then also use that as as something that we put in here, now we've sort of double dipped, right? We've used we've used our our uh, data point twice, and so there are just realities that this can in, introduce some issues. So there's one very simple way around this. So in the in the fixed time regime, a very simple and powerful uh, solution to this is uh, called sample splitting. So the I think the technique of sample splitting is is very old. I don't I don't actually know uh, where it first arose because I think people often just use it without without even saying it. But but basically, sample splitting is a very old idea in statistics. But in it's been particularly useful in causal inference, at least since uh, this 2008 paper by Robbins and colleagues, uh, Jengen van der Land and Chernozukov. So the idea is, is simple. We just take our entire data set, split it into two, into two sections, uh, the training and evaluation sets. And so from everyone in the training set, we'll use these to construct our estimates of the regression and propensity score functions. So you could use something like random forest, but as I'll say, I'll say in just a, a few moments, you can do something slightly better. Um, so we'll just use everyone in the training set to construct these estimates. Uh, and then we'll basically use these to construct our F hat and then take everyone in the evaluation set, evaluate F hat on those guys, and then take their sample average. And now we've got an estimator. And as I'll show you just in a few slides, this. This has just some very nice properties. Um, it greatly simplifies the analysis of, of our estimator. It avoids these so-called Donsker conditions, which I won't go into. And it's also just very simple to implement. It's very easy to, to reason about. Um, so that's what you do in the, in the fixed time setting, where you just take your, your entire data set, if you have access to it, and split it up into two sections. But what do we do in the, in the sequential regime? Um, we propose this, this very simple a uh, tweak of sample splitting, we call it sequential sample splitting, um, where every time you observe a new data point, uh, randomly assign it to the training set or the evaluation set with equal probability. And so the, the idea here is that when we assign it to the training set, it stays in the training set over time. So if, if, if ZT is assigned to the training set, then at time T plus one, ZT is not re-randomized to either, either set. It stays in the training set over time. So um, what do we do? So at, at, each, at each time step, uh, take, take everybody in the training data, use them to uh, train these uh, regression functions and, and propensity scores, and then use that to build our F hat, and then take everybody in the evaluation set and evaluate F hat on those, and you take your sample average, and you've got your estimator. Um, so one, one minor note is just that uh, a commonly cited downside of sample splitting is that you're basically taking your sample efficiency and dividing it by two, right? This capital T here is basically little t by two if you're randomly assigning with, with equal probability. Um, so one really simple uh, fix to this is you just, you swap the samples, take everyone in the evaluation set, use them to train uh, regressions, uh, take everyone in the training set, evaluate F hat on them, and then you get two estimators and now you just take their, their average. Um, so all of our results that, that I show in, in the next few slides, they hold if, even if you're doing this so-called cross-fitting, um, but I'll, I'll probably just omit it because it, it just makes notation a bit more complicated, but there's generally no downside to doing cross-fitting. And in our, our package, it, we use uh, cross-fitting by default because it's usually just a good thing to do. Um, okay, so... Here is here's sort of a, 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 big, a big theorem in this talk. So how do we construct confidence sequences for 
the average treatment effect in randomized experiments. So we're going to use that that sample that sequential sample splitting, um, as well as some previous discussions about the, the doubly robust estimator. So now we're imagining, like before, we have our triplets coming from some distribution p. Uh, in a randomized experiment, we have this propensity score. We know it. It's either like a half or maybe some function of covariates. Um, and then we're going to construct an estimator, um, mu hat t, of the, the regression function, and it doesn't need to be a good one. Uh, it can pretty much be anything. Um, but as we'll see in the next slide, it's better if you get a, if you have a good estimator. But even if it's if it's arbitrarily bad, if you just set them to to constants of zero, um, that's also fine for the correctness. <clears throat> So what we'll do is uh, sequentially sample split into these training and evaluation sets, um, and then construct our estimator as, as I described on the previous slide. And then this expression here, this forms a one minus alpha confidence sequence for the ATE. And so the point is that this expression is the exact same expression that was shown a, a few slides back for the theorem one and theorem one prime. The only difference here is that we know we no longer know, or we're, we're now like being more realistic and saying we don't know f, so we have to estimate it. And so all I'm showing is what are the conditions under which this still forms a, a confidence sequence? What are the conditions under which we can still actually use those theorems? And the conditions are very weak. We just need an estimator for the regression function, and it doesn't even need to be a good one. That's that's pretty much it. Things will be more complicated in the observational setting, but here, things are pretty nice. And so remember, this uh, this estimator can be anything. Like I said, even if you set these to zero, just constants, then this actually, this estimator recovers the inverse probability weighted estimator. Um, and if on the other extreme, we build these uh, estimators with sort of state-of-the-art machine learning tools, then we can greatly improve our efficiency. Uh, like. Like Jeb was saying, we could use random forests, but we can also just use a, a weighted average of several machine learning algorithms. Maybe, maybe the true function is is not is not exactly, you know, maybe it's 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 not looking exactly like what would what a random forest might produce, but maybe it's some average of random forests, and splines and kernels, and maybe neural networks or whatever. Um, so we take we take a weighted average where the weights are de determined by cross validation. Um, this is often called uh, stacking by uh, Leo Breiman, aggregation by Zibikov, but the more common uh, term that I see in the literature is super learning, which is introduced by uh, Vanderland and colleagues. And so we'll we'll just call this uh, super learning going forward. Uh, and so in the experimental setting, uh, all all three of these estimators that I have here, so this in, in the blue dashed line, this is the unadjusted estimator or the inverse probability weighted estimator. This is where you set those those mu hats to zero. Uh, the parametric here is uh, basically where you're using a linear regression to estimate mu. And then the super learner is, is that stacked uh, regression of random forests, blinds, and other things. Um, <clears throat> the point here is that uh, the average treatment effect is, is one. All three of these are providing valid, correct one minus alpha confidence sequences. They all have valid sort of one minus alpha time uniform coverage, but the super learner is the tightest of the three, but they're all they're all correct in this setting. Uh, and the point is actually that the, the regression, the underlying regression function is non-linear. It's uh, continuous, but it's non-smooth. So it's not a it's not a crazy function in this example, but it is it is non-linear. So the, the parametric estimator is just not going to pick up on that, and neither is the unadjusted, of course. OK, so let's uh, let's extend everything that we just talked about to the observational setting where we have no unmeasured confounding. So now uh, we're going to suppose the same situation as before. We observe these this sequence of triplets from the distribution p, but, and, but we're assuming that we have no unmeasured confounding, and that both the propensity score and the regression function are unknown. And so unlike the experimental setup before, remember we just had it so that like we could use any estimator really and the better the better they were, um, the tighter our confidence sets would be, but no matter what, we would always have valid coverage. In this case, we actually need to estimate both of these. But as I'll show, they, they don't need to be 
at fast uh, parametric rates. They can be at slow rates. Um, so we'll sequentially sample split uh, using and use uh, machine learning algorithms to construct our estimators of, of mu. And in this case, we also have to create an estimator of pi. And, and then, so what we're gonna have to assume is that both of these are estimated at uh, t to the negative quarter rates. So something like, uh, so, so it, you know, if, you, if, if things were truly linear and we used a linear regression, then this rate would be something like uh, one over root t. In this case, uh, we, we don't even require that it be that fast. It can be at these slower non-parametric rates. Uh, this can even be weakened a little bit more, but uh, I'll omit that for now. So um, we'll build this, this estimator from the other split. And then this expression now forms a one minus alpha confidence sequence for the AT. And so the point here is that this is the exact same as before. This is the exact same expression that was shown in like the first two theorems, but now I've just changed sort of the conditions under which we can actually get at this if we have a, an observational study. And so I should also say these, these uh, non-parametric rates, these are the same sort of things that show up in the fixed time uh, confidence interval setting where, where you want to estimate treatment effects from, uh, from observational studies even when you're doing things non-sequentially, these are the same sort of requirements that you need. So it's not like we're, we're imposing a bunch of additional assumptions for the sequential setting. Um, and so in the observational setup, so this is the same plot as before, but now we're in this observational uh, regime where here the, the unadjusted estimator is, is the same as before. It's the inverse probability weighted estimator with naive estimates of the propensity score, just taking the average uh, of, of all those uh, in the treatment group. Um, the parametric estimator here is, is basically trying to use a linear regression for the outcome regression for the for mu, uh, and it's using logistic regression for pi. And then sup the super learner, again, is using this uh, stacked or super, super learned uh, weighted regression of, of all these different machine learning algorithms including things like linear regression, but also splines and random forests and, and so on. And so the, the, the underlying regression function is the same as before. It's something that's, that's non-linear, it's uh, non-smooth, but it's continuous. So it's not too crazy, but still uh, these parametric and, and unadjusted estimators can't, can't pick up on that. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, one minor point is that the, the phenomenon of seeing increased uh, efficiency or just consistency for with uh, these flexible machine learning algorithms. This phenomenon is not new. Um, this has been known for quite some time and, and there's a nice uh, 2020 paper on this phenomenon, but sort of in a, in a discussion centered around COVID treat, treatments um, by uh, Ben Kisser and colleagues. But what is new and interesting is that all of these phenomena carry over to the uh, sequential setting without any sort of crazy new assumptions. And so in particular, we don't need to be in a fixed time setting to enjoy the benefits of machine learning and causal inference. Uh, how am I doing on time? Okay, a few minutes. So, um, so what about other functionals? So here we talked about the average treatment effect, but all of these techniques, there's not, there was nothing uh, inherently, uh, there's nothing that was that was just focused on the average treatment effect necessarily. All of these these techniques extend to other functionals. So imagine you are interested in things like stochastic interventions or time varying effects. Um, so as long as we can find an estimator theta hat t, so so theta here is just some general functional of a distribution p. It doesn't even need to be causal, um, but as long as we can find an estimator for that with the property that it's it's sort of like asymptotically linear. If, if you've seen asymptotically linear estimators, this sort of looks like that, except now, instead of having this little OP one over root n term, it's, it's, a, it's like square root log log t by t. And the point is just that if we have, if we can show that our estimator is in some sense good, it's, it's, a, it's a sample average of these influence functions plus something vanishing at a particular rate. I, I don't wanna go too much in the, into the details, but if we can find an estimator like this, then for, for some influence function psi, then all of our previous theorems can be applied. And so 
the the average treatment effect example that that uh, I went through in the in the, the first bit of the talk, this is really just a special case of this somewhat more general theorem. Uh, but there's there's an asterisk here because we need to actually look at nuisance function estimation right before we had to do the sample splitting, and so even under that that sample splitting and using flexible machine learning algorithms, we we still had to look at these on a case by case basis. Um, and make sure that we actually get this, this rate as required. And so we need to do this for other functionals, um, but I, I still think there's, there's a lot of hope for this to be useful in other settings. Okay, so uh, to recap, um, in this talk, I developed uh, some methods and uh, algorithms that have the following properties. And so these are the, these are the goals that, that I outlined in, in the first slide, and so hopefully, uh, we've achieved these goals. So we want we wanted to permit uh, statistical inference for causal effect in an online setting as new data are becoming available. Uh, they now work in both randomized experiments and in observational studies under the same sort of conditions that we would need in a fixed time setting. Um, they make minimal non-parametric assumptions on the data. So we never assumed that anything was linear or Gaussian or anything like that. Um, and we were able to leverage sort of state-of-the-art machine learning tools to improve estimation. In the randomized experiment case, we were able to use uh, this, this, this super learning to actually get better uh, confidence sequences. In the observational setting, we actually needed it in order to get that consistent uh, estimator. And in the paper, we also have extensions to uh, multivariate functional. So if you're interested in things that are not just a univariate functional of the, of the distribution P, uh, and also non-IAD settings. So where you, if you have independent data that are coming from, uh, that are not coming from some, some identical distribution. Um, and all of the, the methods and plots that, that I discussed here, they're all implemented in this, this R package, which you can find on, on my GitHub. And uh, that's, that's everything I have for today. So I wanted to thank you all for listening and uh, to my awesome collaborators for all their work on this. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Ian, for a great talk. Uh, I guess I can start with a question of, uh, so far you've mentioned that the method builds on three assumptions, right? You've met, and you've met, you specifically said that the, it holds with unconfoundedness and non-zero treatment probability. But what about uh, when there is interference? Are these methods still valid? What does happen then? Right, that's, that's a really good question. So, um... So I, I like, I guess there's, there's two parts. One, one is that um, I like to sort of separate the causal identification from the statistical aspect. So, so here, this is a, these are assumptions that are required to, to say that this target parameter, that this counterfactual quantity is actually equal to some other statistical quantity, which is a functional, a functional of P. And uh, so, so under that identification, we were then able to actually get at this, this, uh, this functional. But if you if you were in a setting where with interference, I guess where the consistency would would be violated. Um, I guess what you'd have to do is think about, okay, then under what other sort of what are the causal identification assumptions required to say that some parameter that you're interested in, maybe the average treatment effect, or maybe maybe something else, uh, what are the assumptions required? Such that I can identify that thing with some some other uh, functional of the data. So that's that's a pure uh, causal identification problem. But then once you've done that, whatever functional uh, pops out of that, whatever the functional is that that you can identify this with, if it is nice in the sense that it's like uh, pathwise differentiable, and and it can be written in this uh, where was it? If it can be written in this sort of way, then I think there's hope. Then we just need to like, you know, deal with some rates and things like that. But, but uh, yeah, the, the 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 idea is just that this part was all about causal identification. Can we say that some causal parameter is equal to some other uh, functional of the data? And then once we have a functional of the data, what are the assumptions required on our estimators such that we can actually get at that? So I think there's there's definitely a lot of hope for that. It's not something that I'm an expert on, though. I think there there have been some nice papers on 
extending targeted maximum likelihood estimation, which is which is uh, something that's very similar to uh, W robust estimators and AIPWs. They're all sort of like asymptotically equivalent, but there I think there's been some work on uh, targeted maximum likelihood estimators being extended to the the case with interference, where if you have I think the conditions are something like each in each uh, subject can't have too much influence on the network, but they can have some influence on the network. So it's it, it's an interesting problem, though. Mm -hmm. OK, and uh, a follow up question would be how accurate are the uh, estimators of the treatment effect supposed to be? Uh, not the treatment effect, but the outcome. So in your case, you're using super learner or any other algorithms, but what if there's actually little signal in the feature in the covariates of the, I don't know, patient, et cetera, to estimate the outcomes? Right, right. Okay. So yeah, if you like, so for example, if you're in a setting where X is maybe either just not a very rich set of covariates or it's just not informative. Yep. Um, yeah, or, or if you just have a, a, an estimator that can't really take advantage of all the information in X, maybe X is very high dimensional. Um, in those cases, so in the, uh, let me see, in the, in the randomized experiment setting, that's fine. There's really no, there's really no issue there. You'll just, because, because this, this estimator here for the regression function can be misspecified um, and and that's, and that's completely okay. And you'll still get, you might not be able to get the tightest possible confidence sets, but you can still get valid uh, coverage. Um, even, if, even if X is like totally uninformative. In, this, in the case of uh, observational studies, then you really do need uh, X to be informative enough so that you have no unmeasured confounding. And so that basically you, you need to consistently estimate pi and the regression function. They don't need to be at parametric rates like one over root n, but they need to be at these uh, non-parametric rates of uh, one over t to the quarter. So it's, it's, I guess it's, it's, there's hope, but um, yeah, you do need, you do still need these, like you need information in X. Got it. Settings. Got it. <clears throat> and I guess the final question would be, uh, are you familiar with uh, these kind of methods being used in practice, for example, for uh, testing the experiments like A-B testing, et cetera? Like one way to do it is maybe approach it from the Bayesian point of view and have some sort of stopping criteria, but this is approaching it from a different direction. So I'm wondering if you're familiar with this being used in practice. Okay, so I think um, I, I don't know too much about the, the Bayesian approach. But I think, I mean, as far as I know, the, the yeah, certainly in like medical studies, and I think in a lot of uh, tech companies, I think the the ideas of doubly robust estimation, like targeted maximum likelihood estimation, double machine learning, all these these sorts of ideas, I do think these are being uh, used in some cases because uh, they can be just used to to get uh, you know better better uncertainty quantification in, in experiments. Um, and I think that some companies are doing the non-causal, or, or maybe not non-causal, but the non-doubly uh, robust sequential estimation, potentially. Um, but I don't think anyone's currently combining the two because, I mean, I don't know of any other work that, that does that. And this is this is this was just uploaded like in March of this year. So so these ideas are very new, um, and I think I think that there's. There's probably more people adopting the the techniques of doubly robust estimation and and these uh, advances in causal inference, and probably a bit fewer in the that are they're using ideas from sequential inference, at least from this these using these confidence sequences, because these ideas themselves are are slightly less mainstream. Um, they're they're old ideas, but they're not quite as I guess widely taught or widely discussed. There, there's been a huge revival recently, but um, yeah, I, I think most people are not using confidence sequences in practice right now. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, we, uh, there is a question uh, by Lorinas. Uh, Hi, thanks for the presentation. And uh, the question is, do you have some advice on how to evaluate propensity scores models from observational studies? 
Mm. Add a value. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think I'll be able to give uh, a super insightful answer on that. Other than um, look at the look at the loss function, and also I think like I, I think in practice, like if you if you really don't think that um, these where is it? Sorry. Yeah, if you if you don't think that um, if you don't think that these that these propensity scores are going to be sort of exactly linear or or, or I guess uh, like log linear if you're if you're if you're looking at like a logistic regression if you don't think that these propensity scores are really following the 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 form of a logistic regression or something like that then I would just encourage using a weighted average or one of these super learner algorithms uh, where you combine a lot of different methods because there isn't too much uh, there isn't too much downside to including extra met extra methods um, but at least you're you're hedging your bets sort of against the, the true propensity score having some potentially very complex uh, complex structure that only flexible machine learning algorithms would be able to pick up on mm -hmm. so I guess my advice is just to combine lots of lots of uh, well-studied and uh, methods that, that have, that seem to have a lot of promise All right. for complex, complex yeah. nonlinear relationships. Yeah, I think what Lorinas was referring to is in regards to the overlap. How do we ensure that there is actually an overlap between the two groups that we're trying to compare in observational studies? Oh, I see. And how do we yeah. test if our propensity <laughs> score actually so th there is a follow-up. As I understand, it should not be evaluated based on their predictive ability, but rather on their potential to produce balance in the matched data set. So the propensity scores assessment should be done based on covariate balance, propensity score overlap, common support, and should be iterative process. What about such metrics such as uh, our uh, rock curves, etc.? Right, okay. Um... Sorry, let me just think for a second. So I think the 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 assumptions under which we can we can actually get at these these things consistently is just that everyone needs to have some positive probability given their covariates to be assigned to either group. So I guess that that will sort of ensure if, if we have this assumption that will sort of ensure balance in some I guess asymptotic regime, but maybe that's not a very satisfying answer. I guess I would also defer to a lot of the existing uh, causal literature. I think I, I'm sort of uh, new to some of, some of uh, these ideas in, in causal inference, and I think that the questions of balance in propensity scores and, <clears throat> and you know, things like matching maybe, uh, these are all uh, well-studied areas in, in causal inference, and I don't think that that our work is is too focused on on the those particular aspects because they don't really come into the the sequential setting at least that's not as not as far as I know. I guess if you were to you might want if, if you had some sort of diagnostic for how to test if if uh, treatments were balanced in some sense, then it it might be worthwhile to look at that metric over time. And if you, if you notice at some time, you know, okay, like, let's say you notice at some time T that things are not sufficiently balanced, um, then in a, in like a fixed time confidence interval study, you might, you might be tempted to just keep on sampling, but I don't know if that would necessarily be valid. But if you, if you were to uh, use confidence sequences, you could just say, all right, at this time T, I don't, I don't see sufficient balance among these interesting parts of the covariate space. Let's just keep on sampling and, and, and see what happens. This is, I guess, some flexibility that would be added here. Okay, cool, excellent, thank you. Uh, I believe we are running out of time already. We should be wrapping up, but uh, thank you for everyone who asked the questions and a huge thanks to Ian for joining us today to tell us about uh, their work together with the collaborators and we really appreciate that.
Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, uh, gonna end the stream right here.